Um, it's, it's really my pleasure to um, introduce the F.A. Hayek Memorial Lecture, um, very generously sponsored by Greg and Joy Morin. Nicholas Eberstadt holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute, where he researches and writes extensively on demographics and economic development. Domestically, he focuses on poverty and social well-being. Dr. Eberstadt is also a senior advisor to the National Bureau of Asian Research. Uh, he, his many books and monographs include Poverty in China, The End of North Korea, The Tyranny of Numbers, Measurement and Misrule, The Poverty of the Poverty Rate, Measure and Mismeasure of Material Deprivation in Modern America, and most recently, and very interestingly, Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis. He has presented invited te testimony before the U.S. Congress on numerous occasions and has served as a consultant or advisor to several units within the U.S. government. In 2012, Dr. Eberstadt was awarded the prestigious Bradley Prize, and he delivered the Irving Crystal Lecture in 2020. Dr. Eberstadt earned a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard University, a Master of Science from the London School of Economics, a Master of Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and a PhD in Political Economy and Government from uh, Harvard University. Um, he will address us this morning on the other COVID crisis, prospects for the recovery for recovery from pandemic policies. Would you please help me welcome Dr. Eberstadt. Joe, thank you, and, uh, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's an honor uh, to be awarded the uh, the lecture named after that great man. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but nobody can fill his shoes. <laughs> so I'll do my best up there. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, this morning, I'm going to uh, discuss some problems that were hiding in plain sight before the pandemic, but um, seem to have worsened and intensified uh, under the pandemic and don't seem to have gone away since the pandemic has um, receded. Um, these are problems that we see in the labor market in the United States. We've seen a, uh, a long-term flight from work in post-war America, and the problem has not only intensified in recent years, but it has taken on a whole new dimension as new parts of the population seem to be dropping out of the workforce and entering the pool that is neither working nor looking for work. Um, this, is the, this is the paradox here that attracted my attention originally back in 2016, when I did my first edition of the book, uh, Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis. Um, what this chart shows is the post-war trend for the proportion of what um, labor economists call prime age men, uh, the guys 25 to 54 years of age, I guess the term is kind of self-explanatory. They're not just the backbone of the economy, but they have some other kind of important uh, functions in society, including um, uh, the whole question during the life cycle of forming family and raising kids. And, and what you see is that from, from the mid-1960s to the present, there has been this eerie um, but relentless increase in the proportion of prime age men in the United States <clears throat> who are neither uh, who have no paid labor, um, and it's actually reached a level which kind of. Um, parallels that of the late depression. We didn't have any good, uh, we didn't have any good measurements for unemployment back in the, uh, back in the depression itself. We only started to try to measure uh, 
labor in a sort of a statistical manner in the late 30s and early 40s. The 1940 census was the first time we used the techniques that we have today to, uh, to try to quantify this. That red line there shows you the proportion of guys, prime age guys, back in 1940 who had no paid work. Uh, now, you have to remember that in early 1940, the unemployment rate in the United States was almost 15%. This is a different time and place from where we are today. Today, uh, with higher income levels than we've ever had before, with more education than we've ever had before, with more prosperity than we've ever had before, we have had a 20th century in which the average level of unworking men in our country is higher than it was at the tail end of the Great Depression. So when I say that this is a depression scale problem that we're confronted with right now, I'm not being hyperbolic. And uh, I always uh, try to keep uh, my sources at the bottom of these slides so that you won't think that this is Nick's fake news. Um, <laughs> so when, when, the, when the feds developed uh, the framework for employment statistics and unemployment statistics back shortly before Pearl Harbor. Um, the system itself wasn't actually uh, unveiled until after World War II. I don't think it really could have been on anyone's mind that if a man uh, didn't have a job, he wouldn't be looking for one. There was the Depression mentality. But what we have seen uh, steadily in the post-war era has been a flight from work by prime age men, uh, labor force dropouts, uh, men who don't have a job and are looking for work are called unemployed, men who are neither working nor looking for work, or I suppose they're called many things, but uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that they're called uh, technically by, uh, by, the, uh, by our statisticians is not in labor force. Uh, and if you, if you look at those lines, the, this is just the head count of guys who uh, were unemployed versus guys who were neither working nor looking for work. That gray line is the latter. And you'll see that those two lines haven't touched for 30 years. They didn't touch uh, during the Great Recession. They didn't touch during the worst month of the pandemic. And today, well, let's say 2022, close enough to today, uh, for every prime age man who is uh, unemployed, there are four, over four guys who are neither working nor looking for work. Now this, um, this curious paradox helps to explain why you can hear happy talk from the Fed or from Washington or from Wall Street about how we are at or very near full employment at the same time that we have depression era work rates for guys. And if, if you are measuring uh, economic well-being or economic policy by the unemployment rate, you can see here, you are missing four-fifths of the problem, right? So um, in, <clears throat> in, the, in economic circles, as you know, and in policy circles, as you know, there is a uh, received storyline. I hate the word narrative. Um, I, but the storyline that one hears about this gradual uh, flight from work by prime age men is really a, um, a tale of uh, economic and structural transformation. And the sorts of the uh, keywords that you'll hear are uh, declining demand for less skilled uh, labor, decline in manufacturing, uh, globalization, uh, China enters WTO, offshoring, and so on, so on, so on. Um, 
and there is truth there. Um, the problem, I think, is that it's not the uh, whole truth, and I don't think it's really even most of the story. And I'll show you what I mean from this, um, from this graph here. Taking into account the fact that we're talking about human beings, uh, I would call this a social science straight line, okay? You know, it's a, people are a little bit um, unruly. So, they, so it's not like uh, the orbit of the planets or the geological uh, changes in the Earth. But that's a pretty straight line upward. And if we were to think that the main factor uh, influencing this collapse of work for prime age men was uh, demand-driven economic and structural change, we would have expected that there would be big bounces when we had business cycles here, right? Show me the bounce. I can't see it. Maybe my glasses are bad. Uh, we'd have expected that around 2001, when China entered uh, the World Trade Organization, that we'd seen a shock. I don't see the shock. You know, uh, technological disruption. I mean, we've all got these horrible little devices. Uh, you know, uh, any uh, sign of it? No, I don't think so. Uh, and that's a great challenge, uh, I think, to the received wisdom about what has been underway for the last now more than two generations. Uh, now, uh, my parents told me that I should not uh, do or talk econometrics in mixed company or polite society. <laughs> and so I, uh, I will not. But let's, um, I promise you that this chart here shows that there is no correspondence between tighter or looser labor markets and people moving out of this pool of unworking prime age men and women. Um, <clears throat> at least that has been true since the turn of the century at the very least. Um, there's a lot of movement between, if you're unemployed, you get back into the labor market pretty quick usually. If you are a labor force dropout and you're between 25 and 54, uh, especially if you're a guy, you tend to be a long-termer. Um, and w why that would be the case is a very important question for our nation today. Um, something funny happened uh, during the uh, COVID catastrophe. Uh, we as a country came to experience a labor shortage uh, that was a uh, peacetime labor shortage. We haven't had a peacetime labor shortage in this country before. Uh, and it's an unusual thing, I believe, to find in any affluent society. But you can see it here. This is the, uh, this is the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates of job openings in the United States. And it may not be perfectly accurate, but I think that anybody who goes anywhere in the United States at this moment knows that uh, employers are practically begging for job applicants despite the fact that uh, job applicants have more bargaining power now than at any time in living memory. Um, part of this, I think, can be explained here. Uh, when we look at the pre-COVID trend in work for, in uh, manpower, in workforce, men and women who are either working or looking for work, uh, and continue that trend and compare it to actual labor force manpower in the United States in the COVID period and uh, shortly, shortly thereafter. Um, we are almost four million men and women short, shy, of where we would have expected to be if we were still on pre-COVID trends. We're recovering a bit, but still Really, uh, really short. Um, I'll show you something curious here. Um, I studied economics shortly after the end of the Stone Age. And back then, um, they 
taught us that there was a fallacy called the lump of labor fallacy. And um, briefly, uh, the fallacy was that the good Lord didn't sprinkle a certain number of hours of work on every continent in the planet, and that uh, human, uh, human action creates demand for labor. And so uh, we shouldn't simply assume that, um, that there's a fixed demand for work in the United States or anywhere else. But you'll see the, the, the increase in uh, job openings strangely mirrors the shortfall in uh, manpower here. Um, it is almost as if the lump of labor fallacy has been incarnated. Um, and I don't have a good explanation for you um, yet. Um, I've got some thoughts about it, but it's a, um, it's a paradox to bear in mind. So what, what is with this uh, almost four million shortfall in workers in the United States today? Well, uh, we have to start by um, you know, looking at the elephant in the room, which is the, uh, the COVID catastrophe. We've lost more than a million of our fellow citizens uh, to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Most of those, though, were not people who were in the workforce. Overwhelmingly, the, these were older people and even among those who were uh, not the elderly elderly, most of those were not in the workforce. So the, uh, the impact on American manpower was very, very small. Um, there seems to have been an impact from the disruption of immigration in 2020 and 2021. Uh, not going to say anything about what's happened since then with the chaos in, at the southern border. But in those two years, uh, it looks as if maybe almost a million fewer uh, people of working age came to the United States than we would have previously expected. Uh, immigration statistics are notoriously inaccurate, so I have to be a little bit cheery about this. They're kind of estimated as residual from things that we're a little more confident in. But no more than a million of this four million deficit can be explained by the immigration uh, um, disruption in the first two years of 2020, 2021. Um, then, of course, bless you, then there's, the, then there's the long COVID problem, which we also all know about. And as you are well aware, there are many, many millions of people in the United States who suffer or say they suffer from long COVID. Um, and in fact, uh, the US government has started tracking that. Uh, and the Census Bureau's uh, guesses, you know, relatively recent guesses, are that about five and a half million adults in the US are suffering from, are self-reported suffering from long COVID. Um, and um, out of the workforce. But uh, suffering from long COVID and being out of the workforce does not mean that you are out of the workforce because you are suffering from long COVID. There are people who are in the workforce who are suffering from long COVID. Uh, when you ask people in the same survey, are you not in the workforce because you're suffering from long COVID, only about a tenth of this group uh, describes themselves as being out of the workforce because of the um, because of uh, effects of uh, COVID. Now, um, that's about half a million people, and that's a whole lot of people. It's a whole lot of people, but that's not a whole lot of people in comparison to about four million people. It can only account for a relatively small proportion of that. We put these two components together. And we're still talking, we still need to explain over two and a half million other labor force dropouts, what's going on there. Um, well, part of the answer is 
that there is a new, uh, a new face to the flight from work in modern America. Uh, it's no longer just the uh, prime age men and to some degree the prime age women. Before the pandemic, the, really the only uh, ray of sunshine in the U.S. labor tableau was what was going on with older men and women with the 55 plus. They were the only group uh, from the mid-1990s to the eve of the pandemic whose work rates and whose uh, workforce participation rates were increasing. Well, you can, I mean, this is kind of like, you know, a like QVC channel. This is kind of like, uh, help, I've fallen down and I can't get up. <laughs> There's, um, I mean, uh, where are we? I mean, the, the vaccine rollouts occurred about there. Uh, and yet, despite the vaccine rollouts, despite everything else, uh, the, uh, the labor force participation of older men and women in the United States hasn't recovered. Um, and this is, uh, this is something that has to be addressed and explained. And I think that the, um, the answer to this part of the puzzle has to do largely with uh, the COVID pandemic, but with the part of the COVID pandemic which has to do with co uh, anti-COVID policies, with the unintended consequences of COVID rescue policies. And I'm going to try to show you what I mean by that here. The, the, the U.S. government uh, tried, and I guess we'd have to say uh, arguably uh, succeeded, uh, uh, absent evidence of the contrary, in preventing a second Great Depression or a collapse of the world economy or a U.S. Uh, economic uh, uh, shutdown with the lockdowns, uh, when the lockdowns occurred in early, uh, uh, in early 2020. And uh, both monetary and fiscal policy went into a sort of an overdrive, which we had never seen before. Um, I mean, uh, you all deal a lot with, uh, with monetary economics, and I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't see in this chart if you aren't experiencing in the grocery store uh, already. Um, but that's a, that's a big monetary shock. Uh, and um, we, had, we had a number of problems before that. We were living in an era of uh, free fed money for a very long time before this. Uh, but this is a big shock, and this has had, I think, enduring, enduring reverberations and will continue to for some perhaps very long period of time. Um, the, of course, the, the government, uh, through fiscal uh, resources at the, uh, at the lockdown problem, and that means borrowed, uh, borrowed public money. Um, this isn't a new story, but the, um, but the transfers of borrowed public money during the COVID uh, pandemic itself were absolutely extraordinary. Um, so, if you take a look at this chart, um, this is um, uh, disposable public <laughs> income. This is um, personal consumption. It's personal savings. Something really does look different here, doesn't it? Uh, so the COVID pandemic was the, I think, the only um, economic uh, crisis in history in which uh, personal consumption and uh, personal disposable income went up. And of course, it went up on borrowed transfers, right? And the government transferred, government so overshot in this uh, effort that people had more transferred money in their pockets than they cared to spend. And so uh, we, had a, we had a doubling. We had a more than doubling of the personal savings rate in the United States in 2020 and 2021. And if you do a few calculations, um, that means that a transfer nest egg of about 
two and a half trillion dollars was transmitted to U.S. households um, by the end of the pandemic period. Uh, now, even among friends, two and a half million dollars is a fair amount of money. Um, it works out to about twenty-five thousand dollars per household, um, and this, I think, is the key, one of the keys to part of what we've seen uh, in uh, the changing face of worklessness in the United States today. I think you all will remember the pandemic unemployment benefits, uh, the first $600, then $300 a week. Uh, these were uh, benefits that you didn't actually have to be unemployed to receive. You could have, uh, you could qualify if you're, if you had um, up to about a six-figure income. Um, and for much of the pandemic, uh, these little dots are the estimate of how many Americans were out of work. This gray line is the estimate for the number of people receiving benefits. For much of the uh, pandemic, unlike any previous period in U.S. history, there were more recipients of pandemic and insurance benefits than there were people uh, who were unemployed. So, in effect, Uncle Sam was kind of test driving uh, a universal basic income here. A, uh, a UBI. Um, we can talk about the um, macroeconomic implications of UBI, and we can talk about the microeconomic implications of UBI, but um, I don't think there's a reason to assume that, a, uh, that even this relatively brief spate of um, this, uh, dance with UBI leave the United States entirely unaffected. And um, we do see some evidence, even, uh, even during the pandemic, that uh, people, prospective workers, workers, were responding to economic incentives and disincentives. Um, I tried to show that with this chart here. I don't know if it's as, it's as clear as I hoped it would be. Um, this, is, this is really, this is the, the blue line is the pre-pandemic uh, trend in workforce. The orange line is the actual count of men and women in the workforce. Um, this is really where the vaccine rollout began. And you'll see that over the, um, over the roughly nine months until pandemic unemployment insurance benefits were ended altogether, the return to the workforce was um, uh, anemic, tepid, I don't know, sucky, I don't know what the right word is. <laughs> um, but then once the, um, once the pandemic benefits uh, ended, there was a much more dramatic return to the workforce. It wasn't 100 percent. It wasn't a full snapback. But it was about three times more, um, more uh, significant in magnitude than beforehand. It's obviously a very crude illustration. There are other things going on. But I think, I think the point probably stands. Um, here's. I think uh, this is, uh, I think, um, Sherlock Holmes's dog, but it's barking here. Okay, <laughs> so <clears throat> I, something to me very troubling was occurring in American society uh, before the COVID pandemic. Um, we were we were uh, facing some serious difficulties in generating wealth for the bottom half of households in the United States, 
These are data from the Fed, from the Federal Reserve Bank. Between the time that uh, the Berlin Wall fell and the eve of the COVID pandemic, the real net worth of households in the bottom half of the United States wealth distribution didn't increase at all. Now, we did have enjoy a fair amount of increase in wealth in the U.S. during that period of time, you'll recall. Um, this, uh, these faltering trends, I think, deserve much more attention and much more examination. I think that they may help us to understand part of the populist uh, reaction in the United States in recent decades, um, be that as it may. You'll see that the, uh, the real net worth of the, this bottom half of homes basically doubled during the COVID uh, pandemic. And that jump in net worth all transfer payments, it's all wealth effects from, uh, from transfer payments, from borrowed public money. Now, um, $25,000 may not seem like a whole lot of cash to some people, but if your net worth up until then has been only $25,000, it's going to seem like a whole lot of money. Uh, and it may even seem like enough money to make some decisions about leaving the workforce or staying out of the workforce. About almost a quarter of the homes in the United States headed by uh, householders between the age of um, 55 and 74 um, uh, had net worth on the eve of the uh, of the pandemic of less than twenty five thousand dollars, according to our Census Bureau friends, um, and that group I think may include a large number of the people in this fifty five plus group who have um, taken leave from the workforce in what I surmise, well, which I would describe as a uh, premature retirement, and which I surmise may turn out to be a, a temporary retirement. Uh, we're going to be living with the consequences of both COVID and the COVID policies for a, uh, for a long time. Um, we may hope that many of the Americans who've left the workforce will return, uh, but actually um, I would be more optimistic about the return of our older Americans than some of the young men that I've described here. These older Americans had decades and decades of experience in the workforce. Uh, and know their way around there. Uh, there are too many of the seven, of the pool of seven million uh, prime age American men who can't say the same thing. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to address any questions uh, that I can. Thank you.